How long would it take us to reach Jupiter? The largest sphere in our solar system always seems to be there, shining in the background of space conversations, but it rarely gets the spotlight it deserves. Today, the mission is to face this question head on and figure out, with numbers and context, the real timeline to reach the neighborhood of the gas giant. There isn't just one answer, because it depends on several intertwined factors, the distance involved, the route chosen, the speed achieved, and above all, the purpose of the trip. Do you just want to swing by and keep going, like taking a cosmic shortcut? Or do you plan to break, enter orbit, and study the planet and its moons up close? Each choice completely changes the time calculation. Before we talk about trajectories, it's worth remembering why Jupiter matters so much. It's an extreme natural laboratory. Its colossal anti-cyclones, like the famous Great Red Spot, challenge our understanding of atmospheric dynamics. Its magnetosphere, gigantic and fierce, creates both a shield and a radiation hell that spreads for millions of kilometers. Many are enchanted by Saturn and its rings, and with good reason. But Jupiter makes up for it with a moon system so diverse it feels like a mini solar system. If the goal is science, epic scenery, and possibilities beyond imagination, it doesn't disappoint. And there's more. When we think of potentially habitable places or chances of harboring microbial life, we immediately look to the icy moons. Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto are the celebrities of this group. Beneath very thick ice crusts, there are signs of vast liquid oceans, heated by tidal forces generated by Jupiter itself. If there's a spot outside Earth with good conditions for biological processes, these moons are at the top of the list. It's interesting to note that, although Jupiter is a gas giant with no solid surface, its retinue of rocky and icy satellites, dozens and dozens, totaling 79 in all, greatly expands the scientific menu in an impressive way. But wonder doesn't shorten distances. And when it comes to space travel, distance rules the schedule. Earth and Jupiter orbit the Sun at different speeds, like runners on concentric tracks. This mismatch makes the separation between the two vary all the time. In a favorable alignment, the path shrinks to about 587 million kilometers. In an unfavorable configuration, it climbs to around 970 million kilometers. And if someone decided, just for fun, to cover that distance at 100 kilometers per hour, a typical highway speed, the trip would last roughly 800 years. That's the board on which engineers and scientists have to balance fuel cost, launch window, and total mission time. Having a powerful rocket isn't enough. The planetary calendar is a central character in this story. The arrangement of the planets defines better or worse opportunities to gain speed, cut corners, or save fuel. That's why some missions choose direct routes in a near straight line aiming to reduce the time until encounter. Others prefer an apparently longer path, using gravity assists to speed up for free, and, more importantly, arrive with the right velocity not just to pass by, but to stay. The history of trips to Jupiter makes this clear. In the 1970s, four NASA probes, Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, followed direct trajectories to the giant, they all achieved their primary objective, but none stayed there. Instead, they used Jupiter as a slingshot. The planet's gravitational field stole a tiny bit of orbital energy and returned it as speed to the spacecraft, which were catapulted toward the outer solar system. The logic was clear. When the goal is to explore the far reaches, Jupiter becomes a natural launch ramp. Two missions, however, chose to stay. Galileo, and later Juno, took a different strategy. Instead of accelerating without braking, they performed a more careful orbital ballet, using the gravitational pull of Venus and Earth itself to gain the necessary momentum. At the same time, they arrived at Jupiter with controlled speed, enough to be captured by the planet's gravity and work there for years. It may sound contradictory to take a longer path to spend less, but in space exploration, that's exactly the magic. The more time-consuming route can be the one that saves fuel and makes the most important part possible, which is remaining and studying. How long did that take in practice? The first to reach Jupiter was Pioneer 10. It took the shortest possible route and arrived in about 640 days, just under two years. The price of that haste was a not-so-intimate closest approach, 
around 130,000 kilometers from the cloud tops. A quick pass works when the goal is to capture images, take spot measurements, and move on. Pioneer 11 and Voyagers 1 and 2 also took roughly 600 plus days, but with closer flybys, getting to a mere 22,000 kilometers from Jupiter's clouds at their moments of closest approach. The Galileo mission was a different game, launched to study the Jovian system in depth. Its priority was to orbit the planet for years and investigate the moons. To do that, it needed to arrive slow enough not to escape. Result, it took 2,242 days, almost six years, until orbital insertion. Galileo followed a profile known as Vega for Venus Earth Gravity Assist. One encounter with Venus, then two close passes by Earth, and then the final leap toward the giant. Long on the calendar, spot on in the physics. At the opposite extreme of the stopwatch is New Horizons, the probe that went to Pluto. It left Earth in one of the fastest launches ever and crossed the path to Jupiter in something like 405 days at about 72,000 kilometers per hour. The planet wasn't the final destination, but a deluxe pit stop. The flyby served to gather data and, mainly, to hitch a gravitational ride. The approach yielded a speed increase of about 14,000 kilometers per hour and shortened the journey to Pluto by roughly three years. It's a powerful reminder. When the goal is to go far, Jupiter accelerates dreams. But what about a trip with humans on board? Here, the difficulties multiply. The farthest point ever reached by astronauts was the moon, and that happened more than half a century ago. Even a nearer destination like Mars demands significant timescales. Estimates from NASA itself indicate that the shortest, most fuel-efficient route to Mars would take about nine months to get there, with a round-trip mission plan of around 21 months. Applying that logic to Jupiter, a similar trajectory, adjusted for distance and launch windows, could take close to six years just for the outbound leg. And that's only the beginning. The logistics of keeping people alive and productive in space are brutal. Supplies, water, oxygen, maintenance, redundancies, and scientific equipment all add mass, and mass is synonymous with cost in rocketry. Simple projections indicate that a crew of four would consume around 8,000 pounds of food per year. On a theoretical six-year trip to Jupiter, we're talking 48,000 pounds of food just to get there, not counting the return. Add to that everything needed for life support, research, protection, and contingencies. And the tally grows even more. And there's still the invisible yet ever-present barrier, radiation. Outside the protection of Earth's magnetic field, astronauts face constant bombardment from energetic particles, both from the sun and from galactic cosmic rays. Prolonged exposure can cause genetic damage, raise cancer risk, and harm health in ways we're still learning to mitigate. There's also the human factor. Spending years confined in a limited environment, far from family and everyday life, affects mood, sleep, relationships, and performance. Training helps, but no one truly trains to see Earth as a distant blue dot for that long. The good news is that new generations of suits, systems, and protocols, driven by programs like Artemis, have been maturing solutions that make long missions less risky. Back to the root, because it influences everything. A spacecraft can follow an almost straight path, like aiming and firing, or opt for a more elaborate trajectory, passing near other planets to perform gravity assists. These flybys require specific alignments. As a vehicle approaches a planet, gravity pulls, the craft gains energy, and its path is redirected. This ride comes from the planet's own orbital energy. The impact on the planet is so small it's virtually impossible to notice. But for the spacecraft, the difference is huge, shaving years off the trip or saving tons of propellant. In return, these choreographies extend the time to the destination because you need to wait for the right window and sometimes take strategic detours before advancing. The dilemma then is straightforward. Get there fast by burning more fuel or save propellant and accept a longer trip. For flyby missions, where the goal is to pass by, observe, and move on, it's worth stepping on the gas. The problem arises when the aim is to enter orbit. If the probe arrives too fast, 
The braking needed to be captured by the planet's gravity requires an absurd amount of fuel. Few missions can afford that. That's why planners who intend to stay prefer to spend time beforehand to save propellant later. It's counterintuitive, but essential. This conceptual difference appears in the terms you always hear, flyby and orbital insertion. A flyby is the close pass. The craft speeds through the planet's environment, photographs, measures, collects data, and leaves. Orbital insertion, on the other hand, means you have to reduce speed, find the right trajectory, and only then circle the planet for long periods. The first is fast, the second is labor-intensive, and opens the door to deep science. In the near future, two missions help visualize what's coming regarding the icy moons. NASA's Europa Clipper was designed specifically to study Europa, mapping its surface, investigating ice thickness, composition, and signs of the subsurface ocean. Europa Clipper was successfully launched on October 14, 2024, using SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket. The goal is to reach Jovian orbit around 2031. The choice of a longer route, with controlled arrival speed, reflects exactly what we've discussed. It's better to arrive at the right pace to carry out dozens of flybys of Europa and extract the maximum amount of data. In parallel, ESA's JUICE mission was launched on April 14, 2023, and will also arrive in 2031 with a special focus on Ganymede while also studying Europa and Callisto. The shared goal is to understand, in detail, whether these worlds hide conditions capable of sustaining life. Putting everything on a timeline, an extremely fast probe like New Horizons can reach Jupiter in a little over a year, if the plan is just a flyby. For mission profiles similar to the Pioneers and Voyagers, think 550 to 650 days, depending on the window and trajectory. To enter orbit and work in the Jovian system, the typical time frame climbs to several years, as we saw with Galileo, and as we'll see with the dedicated moon missions. The longer time is the price of being caught by Jupiter at the right speed, turning a lightning visit into a scientific season. Given this outlook, the inevitable question remains. Can we reduce these timelines? In theory, yes, if we accept gigantic fuel costs to accelerate and then break at the destination. In practice, however, mass, budget, and risk constraints make the smart path the one that makes the most of the solar system's gravitational dance. For robotic missions, this balance is already routine. For crewed missions, we still add the human factor, radiation protection, and monumental logistics, which push timelines and complexities to another level. Even so, the effort pays off. Jupiter is a key to understanding how planetary systems form and evolve. Its icy moons may be the best candidates in the solar neighborhood to host some kind of biosphere. Its magnetic field teaches lessons about plasma physics and extreme environments. Every hour invested in getting there yields years of high-quality science. And, who knows? answers to some of the questions that most unsettle us. In short, if speed is everything and the mission accepts a simple hello and goodbye, it's possible to cross the path to Jupiter in just over a year with a very fast probe and a well-planned gravity assist. If the idea is to flirt with the planet, gather pass-by data, and move on, expect something in the range of a year and a half to two years. Now, if the plan is to break orbit, and explore the Jovian system in depth, be ready for a journey of several years, with strategic loops, calculated launch windows, and an arrival at just the right speed so you don't slip back into deep space. The giant has a lot to offer, and that's why we keep pointing telescopes, antennas, and spacecraft in its direction. The road is long, but the destination is worth every day of the trip. If you enjoyed this, leave a like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.